how you come down. Here we are. Got the co-pilot here, Miss Sarah, elusive from the camera, more elusive than a Sasquatch. <laughs> oh, I think I heard a giggle. Almost equivalent of a whoop in the forest. <laughs> Should we swing the camera over to her? What? <laughs> anyway, what's new? What's going on? Here we are. Um, it's later in the day. We poisoned ourselves last evening. Should have learned our lesson because the last time we bought this shit from the grocery store in the deli section, they make some pre made, like a nacho chub dip, but it's not the bean one, lair dip. It's, I think it's cream cheese or something. Some kind of cream cheese, right? Cream cheese mixed with sour cream. Cream yeah. cheese and sour cream? Well, Maybe that's it. No, because we've had that before. You make, and then the crab and the prawns. Well, it's the white cream cheesy sour cream mix in the bottom, about two inches. Mm -hmm. And then they put a thin layer of like, what's that other stuff? Salsa, sort of? Seafood sauce. Seafood salsa. And then shavings of that fake crab. And they sprinkle a handful of cooked shrimp on top. Tastes great. Sarah woke up first for three hours or four hours in the middle of the night, not doing too good. And then it, I followed through at about, I think I was, it really woke me up. It hit me at five in the morning or four thirty, And it was so nasty. Upset stomach, you know that stomach pain where you think you're having a heart attack? Really sucked. So, no fishing this morning with the fleet. And we finally got over it, sort of, still a little groggy. I just went out and put the prawn traps out so we catch some fresh, hopefully get enough fresh prawns for dinner tonight. There we go, that's the update. Now, what else can I say? Uh, remember that somebody sent in the picture of the fairy in the palm of the hand photo? Whole bunch of you, a sleuth sent in that that picture's been around the internet forever and made by somebody. So to the person that made up, it was their uncle, blah, 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 and emailed us in. <laughs> What'd you get out of it, right? There you go, great effort. Great effort. Great, great time of life spent. <laughs> anyway, no big deal. Moving along. Here we go. This is a book I found that I probably unfortunately passed on a few times because of the length of the email. It is a hugey. This is the first one I came across, so I'm diving in. And Sarah just asked me if I proofread it. No, I didn't. <laughs> I never do. I don't have time. And this is titled My Bigfoot Sighting When I Was Nine and other encounters. Hello Steve, first I want to say, feel free to use my name. I am Mary Catherine Butcher Lentz. This is my first email to you. I'm originally from Clay, West Virginia, and I now reside in the capital city of Charleston, West Virginia. Been to Charleston. I will warn you now, this is a very long email, but it has to be. I had to write all of this down at once or I would never write it at all, so please forgive me. No, no apologies needed. We're going in. This is your time. I've been watching your channel for a long time. I'm an avid hunter and fisher, taught by my taught to by my father, whom we jokingly told him he was the proverbial great white hunter. If it had fur, fins, fangs, or feathers, he had it mounted on the wall somewhere in his house. LOL. After a few years of watching your channel. I've gathered up the courage from listening to others to finally write you and share my stories. I want to say thank you for providing a safe platform and environment for myself and others to share our stories and encounters. After listening to the scientist tell his story about his missing time, I've gathered up the courage to send in my stories and encounters, for I too have had two of missing time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let me tell you of my Bigfoot encounters. Encounter number one. Are we moving anywhere? Just a minute. All right. 
We're anchored up behind an island. Encounter number one. When I was nine years old, my family and I lived in the town of Clay, West Virginia. My younger brother and I each had a bedroom in the upstairs portion of our home. We lived across the street from a family grocery store. It was summertime in 1974 and I was nine years old. I was awakened by some strange noises, banging sounds from across the street. There was but one single street light in front of the grocery store that lit up half the parking lot. I looked out of my window and I could see what I thought was a man going through the trash cans at the side of the store. Our house was on embankment above the street so I had a bird's eye view of what was going on. This man grabbed three trash bags, threw them over his shoulder, and started walking closer towards the street light. As he got closer towards the front of the grocery store, I could see that he was really tall. And in my child's mind, I saw that he was wearing a black fur coat, and it was summertime. There was an awning on the front of the store, and he had to walk around that awning. Sorry, he had to walk around it. That awning was nearly 10 feet high. When that happened, I gasped. When I did that, his head snapped and he looked right at me. He, I ducked down below the windowsill. I counted to 10 and I peeked just a little bit out of the window, but he was gone. A couple weeks later, I heard the same sounds again and when I looked out, he was back in the trash cans. This time I stayed deathly quiet and I didn't stand directly in front of the window. I kept the curtain drawn and just barely peeked. This time he carried the trash bags again. But this time I could smell the garbage. Oh, it smelled awful. I'll never forget that smell. And he used the sidewalk again, walking in front of the store. But this time he looked up at the house. How could he see me? I only used one little bit of an eye to look out the curtain and I was and I was way down low, and it was at least 150 feet, and I never saw that one again. Wow. Encounter number two, fast forward, fall of 76, late October. The area is Devil's Backbone, Clay County, Nicholas County Line, West Virginia. My uncle had a hunting cabin that he and my father used. My family went up a week before deer hunting season was to start to prepare it. My mother and I cleaned the inside. My dad, my brother Phil, and two of my male cousins, Ricky and Jimmy, cleaned up the yard, cut firewood, cleaned up, that, cleaned up the outhouse, a barn, and general maintenance. Dad had to work night shift at the mine, so he left the rest of us at the cabin at night during that week. Things were fine the first two nights, and on the third night, all hell broke loose. We had two of our hunting dogs with us, a beagle and a walker coon hound. It was after dark, mom and I were playing cards, and the boys are playing a board game. First, the dog started barking back at the kitchen door. Mom grabbed a shotgun, ordered us, all of us, children to the bedroom at the center of the house. This was an old farmhouse we were using, that, that's the way it was designed. Something was hitting the outside of the house, and hard. And all of a sudden, we heard a blood-curdling scream slash growl at the front of the house and that's when the dogs went under one of the beds and refused to come out. My youngest brother joined them. My male cousins were both seniors in high school and they wanted to go outside. My mother said no. She had started a fire and all the fire she had started a fire and all of the fireplaces and turned off all the lights and she put us all into beds and she set up that night, and we had no telephone there. Something was throwing rocks up onto the roof. We could hear them rolling down the tin roof. Every hour or so, we would hear another scream, and something hit the side of the house again. Whatever was out there really was trying to scare us bad. Mom would say, that ain't no bear. I eventually fell asleep. The next morning, when Dad got off work at the coal mines at Wyden, he came by. Mom had all of her stuff packed, woke all of us kids up with no breakfast, and told us all to get into the truck. We were leaving. Dad didn't ask any questions. He took us back to town. Boat coming? No, I'm just looking around.
Encounter number three, fall 77. We lived on mountaintop known as Beachy Ridge. We were renting 13 acres and we had a small homestead there. We were raising chickens and pigs and rabbits for food. We had several hunting dogs and dogs as pets and livestock guardian dogs. We had electric and pot belly stove for heat. We had two separate wells in the property, one for drinking, 300 feet deep, and one for doing laundry and watering the animals, 100 feet deep. Both of these wells were directly behind the house. We also caught rainwater for, the, for those purposes as well. The landowner farmed Christmas trees behind our house. There's a very thick pine forest between us and the mountaintop ridge behind our home where there were giant boulders for over half a mile along the top of the mountain. My brother and I used to climb to the top of the mountain and play around these boulders. And there were times where I would get that uneasy feeling because I was being watched. And my brother, who was two years younger than me, would just want to keep on playing. And I would tell him we need to leave. And he would say, quit being a bossy sissy. To which my reply would be, okay, I'll leave you up here by yourself to find your own way home through the pine trees. He would be right on my tail then to go home. Other times I would feel perfectly fine to be up there, but more often than not, I wouldn't be up there five minutes and it was time to go home, the feeling would hit me. I never smelled any smells or heard any screams, but I just felt uneasy. Encounter number four, summer 78. That summer my mother and I were sitting in the living room and we had at least five dogs on the porch when all of a sudden every dog jumped off the porch and took off running chasing something, barking and carrying on. Ten seconds later, they were crying, yelping in pain and running back to the house to, to try to get inside the house, which they knew they weren't supposed to do. Mom stepped out on the porch. She came back, allowing the dogs inside, closing the door behind them. Our front door was a glass French door. We didn't have a curtain for that door. We had a blanket to cover it. Mom pulled the blanket over the door. She said, be quiet, then whispered, get my shotgun. I ran to the gun cabinet, got the 12 gauge, a box of shells, handed it to her. As she slowly loaded it, she says, go back to your bedroom with your brother. My brother was back in his room. I asked, what is it, mom? She said that thing followed us back here from the cabin. I just sit down on the floor and handed her some more shells. Dad wasn't home and he was working a different shift. Whatever was out there, didn't hit the house, didn't make another sound, the dogs were hiding somewhere in the house. But my mother, God rest her soul, she held down the fort till dad got home. And he brought reinforcements too. Hold on, I'm gonna move that fishing rod so it doesn't scream. All right. And he brought reinforcements too. You see, he had this wonderful habit of calling to see if mom needed anything from the grocery store and she said, yeah bring some friends and she told me what happened dad showed up with eight more guys with guns and flashlights and headlamps they went around the house and our property turned out we were missing 11 chickens something had reached over and bent down the fence of the chicken coop and took them right out of the chicken yard and broad daylight in broad daylight there was blood everywhere and feathers it looks like whatever took them ate them right there beside the fence, he said, but they couldn't find any tracks. Within the week, Dad had sold off the rest of our chickens, but that one must have been passing through because we didn't have any other problems. Encounter number five, my dad's story. This is the one hunting story my dad would only tell, tell me happened to him while coon hunting in the summer of 76. Dad went coon hunting with a friend of his named I'll call him Mr. G. Dad and Mr. G were great hunting buddies. Dad had a pedigree walker coonhound named Pretty Boy. Dad took my brother, who was 11, and Mr. G took two of his four sons at that time. They were 13 and 11. It was early in the evening, just after dark, and they had turned the dogs loose. And they had just hit a hot trail that could, that could tell by the way the dogs were barking. The dogs had treed one early, so... The hunters caught up with their dogs to catch the raccoon. They're up on a high ridge. They had five dogs with them and they were all barking like crazy. 
When they finally got to where the animals were, Dad said they smelled a dead animal nearby. But the dogs were concentrating on what was up in the tree. They had the boys grab the dogs, put them, put them on a leash to pull them away from the tree. And as they did, that something up in the tree began to growl and did not sound like a coon. First, they thought the dogs may have treated a, treated a bear, but this sound, but this sound a bigger and meaner. They shined their lights up into the tree, but they couldn't see anything. Whatever was up there, it was absorbing the light. It was so dark. They can see something black. It was blocking the branches and the light would not pass through it, but they could not discern what it was. And then it screamed. And about 30 seconds later, something on the opposite ridge behind them screamed back. My dad said, let's get the hell out of here. By then the dogs had their tails tucked between their legs and were pulling the boys back down the hill by their leashes. They only had to go down to the bottom of the hill they were on to get to the truck. But between them and the truck was a fence. A fence of three strand barbed wire about halfway down the mountain. They were walking at a pretty good pace when they heard a large tree crack and fall over and there was no wind. Dad says, for what he could recollect, there was no noise except for no tree frogs and no night sounds at all, just the tree crashing. He said he felt like his head was stuck in a bucket, like the woods were all completely empty except for their breathing and crunching their feet on the leaves as they ran. Like almost every word they spoke echoed when they said, hurry, something else echoed their words. When they're almost to the fence, I can hear something walking in the woods, crashing footsteps, like a man running through the woods behind them. That's when dad said, let go of the dogs. They know where the truck is. When the boys let go of the dogs, they took off running down towards the truck. Dad and Mr. G helped the boys through the fencing and were just, and were just starting through themselves when dad said it sounded like a bulldozer was coming down off the hillside. Everyone took off running towards the truck holding the holding the room flashlight in one form or another. The fathers holding their son's hands. When they got there the dogs had hopped up on the tailgate and were in the back of the truck and their boxes just waiting for their owners to close the door. He said he felt so much pressure in his head and on his body, it was like he was underwater. He wouldn't admit this till years later that he was so scared. Everybody loaded up and they took off with the crashing sound headed towards the truck. Dad said they got about a hundred feet when something stepped out onto the side of the road and had to be at least 10 feet tall and four feet thick. It was black and hairy and had red glowing eyes. Mr. G swerved to the left side of the road and pushed down the gas pedal. Dad said that that thing could have reached out its arm and grabbed the truck, but it just stood there as they drove past. He said, I think it just wanted to let us know it was there and wanted us to see it. That the area that they went hunting at was in Clay County, West Virginia, over near a community called Big Otter. The people over there call that area Booger Holler. Old timers in these parts used to call what we called Bigfoot Boogers. Both my parents have heard stories growing up in the 1940s and 50s. Don't stay out late or the, or the Boogers will get you. Encounter number six, my missing time, story number one. In the fall of 2004, I was working as a restaurant manager in Charleston, West Virginia for a company called Shoney's. My husband and I were raising two small children and his teenage son from his first marriage they had joint custody with his first wife. Two weekends a month, my stepson would spend weekends with his mother and I would take him to her to the town of Spencer over in Roan County, West Virginia. That's approximately 60 miles north from where we live in South Charleston. I had to go to work that Friday morning at 5 a.m. getting off at 4 p.m. I got home by 4.30. I had a change, grabbed the stepson and his luggage, hopped into my royal blue 99 Geo Prism, five-speed four-door, and took off for town, for the town of Spencer, West Virginia. 
An hour and a half later, I was dropping him off at his mother's mobile home. I only stayed for a few moments for personal pit stop. The weather was starting to turn and I wanted to get home before it started to rain. By the time I left, it was 6.15 p.m. I remember getting just a few miles outside of town and starting down a mountainside where there was a large wooden building enclosed with chain link fence that acted like a state road garage on my right as I continued to head south on Old State Route 119 where they stored road salt and there was railing for the road on my right and it was foggy because it had rained through there and being up in the mountain ridge I was darting down the side of the mountain and driving through the fog bank to get down to the valley. Now the road I was traveling was 119. This is a twisty, turning road headed towards the town of Clendenin. And I was in for a 30 mile trip and I'm driving a manual shift. I know that I'll have to downshift a lot, hit the brakes a lot, and a lot of switchbacks to get down this mountain. And as it's starting to get dark, the next thing I know, I'm driving flatland and I'm looking at a mailbox in front of my car and I'm doing about 40 miles per hour which is way too fast for this road. I swerve to the left, and I'm ending up in somebody's yard. I swerve back to the right, which cuts me back onto the road. It's pitch dark. I downshift, slow down, and within less than 100 yards, I find a place to pull over and turn my car off. My cell phone's ringing in my shirt pocket, and I answer it. It's my husband asking me, where the hell am I, where the hell I am? And I don't know. I don't know what time is it. I say, hold on, hold on. I almost wrecked the car. He says, where are you? I said, I don't know. With the headlights on, I look around. I see a street sign. I recognize it. And I'm two miles from the interstate. I've just traveled 30 miles. How can that be? My husband informs me it's one in the morning, six hours and 45 minutes to drive 30 miles. And I don't remember where I've been and six hours and 45 minutes to get there? What's going on? What has happened to me? Why aren't you home? I start crying. I tell him I don't know. I tell him what just happened. He says, stay put, I'm coming to get you. About 45 minutes later, he and his brother show up. Now my husband cannot drive a manual shift, so his brother drives my car and he drives me home in his brother's car. And I'm still crying and shaking all the way home. And another weird thing is, when I got home, my bra was on wrong side out. Ew. That's creepy, creepy, creepy. And not uncommon, unfortunately. My second encounter missing time, November 2015. My mother passed away from pancreatic cancer suddenly in October of 2015. She and my father had been married almost 52 years. They hunted together every year during deer season. That year, my father asked me to go with him. They belonged to a private hunting club, and he asked me to go with him to that private land. The night before we packed up everything, we needed four-wheelers on the four-wheel drive truck trailer. I laid out all my clothes, and it was going to be bitterly cold. I planned on dressing in layers. Dad said he was going to drive me out on the four-wheeler, put me in a tree stand in a grove of trees on top of the ridge, then he was going to go down to the bottom near the watering hole. He's disabled. Sorry, there's a little bit of punctuation, no big deal. One more time. Then he was going to go down to the bottom near the watering hole. He's disabled. He was going to hunt from the four-wheeler. If I needed him, I could text him on his phone. Otherwise, we would meet up at the truck one hour before sunset. He did not want to be out in the woods after dark. Everything went according to plan and I was, as I was dropped off before daylight. I'd been to this property before. It was ever made into a private hunting land back when I was a teenager, so I was familiar with the layout of the land. About an hour after sunrise, I started getting the feeling that I was being watched. I didn't hear anything, say anything, smell anything. The night before, I'd gotten plenty of sleep, a good seven to eight hours, seven to eight hours. But all of a sudden, I told myself I was tired. I needed to take a nap. I unloaded my gun, put the bullets in my pocket, laid the firearm up against the tree, 
I climbed down, walked over, found shelter up against a large rock, took off my coat and laid it down, and lay down on my coat. I took out my cell phone. I looked at the time. It said 6.09 a.m. I then probably turned it off, and I don't know why. It was like I was dreaming, but I was telling myself I'm going to be okay. I remember laying down on my coat. It was 11 degrees Fahrenheit. That is bone epping cold. My next moment of consciousness, I was sitting back in the tree stand, holding my gun, loaded, sorry, holding my loaded gun, wearing my coat. My cell phone was buzzing. In my pocket, eight missed calls, 11 texts from dad, and he was texting me. I got a buck. Girl, where are you? What's going on? I got a buck. I got a 10 point. Where are you? You who? And so on and so forth. I called him back and said, sorry, dad, I was on airplane mode trying to save the battery. He bought that one. But honestly, I had no clue what the hell happened to me. He said, I got the deer. He said, I got the deer on the back of the four-wheeler with the winch. I can come and show you, but you're going to have to walk to the truck. I said, no problem. Get up here. I'm right where you left me. In about 10 minutes, I heard him coming up the road. We went together back to the vehicle, loaded up the four-wheeler with the deer, and made our way back home. And as I was undressing, my underwear was missing, but I found them. They were nylon slash spandex, and they were tucked inside the toe of my boot. Steve, I was wearing two pairs of long johns, two pairs of sweatpants, and then my Realtree camo pants. What the F? Now, I can't explain or wrap my head around the encounters with the beings, the earth creatures. They are tangible beings, though the government is lying to us and trying to hide things from us. They can't hide what we see, hear, smell, and feel. They can lie all they want. They can lie like rugs till the cows come home. I don't give an F. What bothers me is my missing time. That is something I feel they're lying about as well. The thing that scares me is that there is, this is something that they cannot control. That they, bracket, aliens slash interdimension, interdimensional beings, and bracket, are just picking us at random? Or is it that we were pre-chosen they're doing it to us more than we know? I have the most god-awful dreams, at least I pray they're dreams, slash nightmares. I wouldn't wish these things on anybody except, save for maybe some of the government people that are trying to hide this shit from us. Maybe if one or two dozen of them have gone through what me and other people have, maybe the shit would stop. Maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part. Anyway, Steve, I'm sorry it's been so long, but if I didn't get it all out at once, and I tried to piece it out, I wouldn't have had the courage to tell it all. My thoughts and prayers are with you and your lady on your loss of your horse, a beautiful Mr. Macaroni. I lost my cat of 13 years. His name was Stitch. He was part Maine Coon and Siamese, and he was so smart, just like Mr. Macaroni. And I'm a firm believer that our animal spirits are with us, even after they pass, sort of like a guardian angel, and that they're watching over us, and that they will be waiting on us when we go to heaven so we could be together again. I know my dad and his hunting dog, Pretty Boy, are in their happy hunting ground. Thank you, Steve, for reading and listening. Mary Catherine Butcher Lentz, Charleston, West Virginia. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm glad you got it all out. That's what we try to encourage everybody to do, right? If you get a chance, if you finally get the courage to share your shit, get it all out. Get it all out in one go, and you did. There's so much there for me to even attempt to comment on. I wonder how many other people are, are, are waiting. So I said that to somebody the other day. I've said it here too about people. I'm trying to picture people going, you know what? This is it. This is the week I'm going to do it. I've been watching this channel for a couple of years. I'm going to do it. I'm, doing, I'm, I'm sending in my story. And then they just can't do it. That's fine. That's all right. In time. Or not at all. But share it here. If you, uh, if you get the chance, this is the place to do it. You're going to get it heard word for word. Right? Man, there's a lot to take in and think about. West Virginia, there's some crazy mountains around there, isn't there? But imagine what it looks like in the autumn. It must be absolutely stunning there. Whew. 
Whew. Another one enters the club. I wonder if anything else has happened to you since. If it has, you know what to do. <laughs> Email us. Now what's this? I'm gonna get another one shared. Sarah just went down below to go pass out. <laughs> she can't last more than five minutes hearing me read. It puts her, puts her in a coma. Now, what was I gonna say? I always forget, and I just remember something um, about the videos. So there's something possibly alarming about these things right here. Obviously, there should be a lot alarming about them. But so I took note that when Darren was in the woods the other night and these people were coming in near him and he said that this pitch black obviously each time he reached for his video camera it went flatline dead silent but when he reached for his cell phone they kept on doing their thing making noises and banging on the trees and shit what's the difference what is it about these being used as a video camera that is either a undetectable right or okay we all know it is fact i've had some very serious tech people including professional hackers i'm in contact with both in and out of this country said flat out that these little devils listen to us all the time do i believe that absolutely so did the makers of these little items do, do they know something we don't when it comes to what these can actually record? And do who, whoever it is that monitors us through these, which is no conspiracy, that's a guarantee. What are they? What else are they monitoring through us? Right? What else are they monitoring through us with these little freaking shitty little devices that are good and bad at the same time i wonder but that's a that's a note that i took and put right in the its own little shelf in the back of my head as soon as i heard darren, darren say that he reached for his video camera flat line they flashed up again he grabbed his cell phone they didn't react something to be th to think about now this is titled, South Mississippi Encounter, question mark. So you've been following your channel for some time now. Because of some past encounters my son and I have had with some weird stuff. But I've also learned that in my state there's a lot of Bigfoot activity. And because of our family business, we were camping at a lot of state parks. I was concerned about our safety, so I started paying better attention to what people were experiencing online so that we could know what to watch out for. Good move. I'm stoked to read that. Early on in this process of our own research, we had learned about some ways to identify Bigfoot activity, and this caused us to be somewhat alarmed when we drove into a North Mississippi State Park to stay in a cabin for a night. This was December 18th, 2019. We were pretty excited about the park because it has some varied terrain and we like to hike. Well, upon arrival, what alarmed us was that there were trees bent completely over and trees still rooted in the ground, but pushed into big X's. My son and I immediately were concerned and knew we had to keep our eyes open. Our cabin was at the far back of the campground, and as it was, just a few days before Christmas, there was almost no one in the park camping. The leaves were off of the trees, and the sky was overcast with a cold front threatening to come through, which meant rain, no snow. When we arrived back to our cabin, it was an old CCC cabin made of the logs and timber right there in the park. The cabin was almost a hundred years old and very impressive in that it was still standing in, standing and in fairly reasonable condition. As I walked up, to the door to unlock it, an owl started hooting. Then another alarm to me because it was still in the daylight and not even close to sunset. Yes, it was overcast, but not dark. Yet, and I felt unnerved because 
The owl was only seemingly a few yards from me. And the sound was coming right at me. It hooted several times. Every single time I would go in and out of the cabin to bring gear into the cabin, the owl would hoot. My son had the same experience. It was as if either we or someone or something else was being notified that we were there. It felt more like we were being harassed. Steve, I've lived, I have lived and do live now in South Mississippi forest for over 30 years. And I mean, never ever do owls hoot in the daylight here. When you hear an owl hoot, it's usually late at night, around 11 p.m. or later. And granted, we had traveled about six hours north, but still. So, of course, I was fully alert, and I told my family about it. The inside of the cabin was very interesting from a historical perspective. And would have been great to visit, like a museum. But all the wood was very dark. And this only added to the darkness, the, sorry, added to the dreariness outside and what we'd already experienced along with having absolutely no one around and inside of the dense forest. I tried to keep calm and not to talk about my unnerved feelings, but my son had already picked up on it himself, not saying anything to me. People got to stop being open and just get it out no matter what, when. My husband and I slept in the loft overlooking the large living dining room with a fireplace, and our son slept on the sofa bed, or on the sofa down below in the same room. We were, in essence, in the same room. I was creeped out all night. It was very difficult to sleep, and I kept waking up feeling trepidation, and like I really badly wished we had not stayed in this cabin. I could hardly wait for morning so we could pack up and leave. It was an unexplainable feeling. Usually, once we're inside the cabin, we can we can still that lonely feeling. Sorry, when we get we get during times like this, when we stay at these park cabins with no one around in the dead of winter. This time, no, this was really bad, and I just wanted to be up and gone from there. We finally did get up the next morning. Our son told us that he had not slept all night, and it took all he had to keep from running out of the cabin screaming. And getting in the van holy shit that's crazy he said that panic he said that panic was like nothing he'd ever experienced and he and i compared what we were feeling and it was pretty much the same except that his was far worse that's because he's younger in years and more in tune is what i would have to say guess it had him deeply disturbed and he couldn't get packed fast enough and out of the cabin to the van to leave and would you know it, the night's rain had our vehicle stuck in the mud, and it took some time to get it out of the mud. As my husband and son worked in the van, I kept my eyes to the woods all around me. When we drove off, we vowed never, ever to stay at this park again. We've often had to stay in State Park in Middle Mississippi, and when we are there, we often see trees bent all the way over with tops touching the ground. It's bizarre looking. I always have the creeped out feeling at this park. It never goes away, not even in the cabin. I've asked around and apparently it's well known that there are lots of Bigfoot in our state parks. Why not, right? I've never felt that kind of weirdness in my own woods, but I never discount anything like that. And I truly believe that there is a whole lot more to this whole thing and that it is more than just a creature issue. Well, my story is not all that interesting, but I thought you might find it interesting to hear about some of what's going on in Mississippi. Most people don't like to talk about it, but we have a lot of UFO sightings around here. My family has had more than four, and it's not pleasant at all. One of them was extremely terrifying. These things mean no good at all. We love living in the forest and wouldn't want to give it up for anything. However, we highly respect that it's home to a lot of creatures that don't want us around sometimes. We put our trust in God and keep on. Be safe out there. Your videos are absolutely beautiful, especially to a flat lander in the deep south who will probably never see terrain or snow like that. All right, there you go. Another honest person coming forward and utilizing all the people's knowledge here for the better of their their day-to-day -day activities in the wilds, right? Thank God.
you know, it's funny while I was reading what I was thinking about just now was obviously we're encouraging people to, um, to ignore who we've been misled to believe our authorities. <laughs> God, that word makes me freaking laugh and cringe at the same time. Authorities bite me. Every one of you sons of bitches out there that's, that's actually had your brain convinced that you were an authority over the people. Yeah. Good luck with that, stupids, right? No, you're not. You're just a pawn. You're a drone. You're a very lost soul working for the absolute enemy of the people. That's what you're doing today, unfortunately. Except for those real good people with badges on that, that come from and serve the same small communities they live in. They're heroes to a point, most of them, right? I would imagine. Bite my lip before I keep going on that tangent. But anyway, what would be good if that's how this is working? If we are getting, if we are helping the people to realize that they are better off listening to only the people. Man, if we can do that on a large scale, we can change this whole existence right around. We can turn everything negative around if we, maybe, who knows, maybe we're slowly figuring out the recipe to do that here, right? We may just be slowly figuring out the recipe to take that authoritative, authority, label and position, and strip it from those evil sons of bitches who are actively participating in a war on mankind right now, a war on human beings. It's on our face, there's no denying it. But if we can we can show the people that it's best to just listen to the people, that would take the power away from those pricks like instantly. But then again, we have to take it a couple steps further and get everybody to stop the machine right now. Just stop it. The flatline the machine, which means stop giving them your money. At the same time, be brave. Don't be scared. Your community will take care of you. We all come together as a community. Stop the flow of funds to the evil pricks and watch them shrivel up instant. Right? There wouldn't be enough prisons to house us all if they tried to go that route to make us continue to give them money. I'm down. You guys are down. I'm down. Set the date. I'll do it. Well, I'll do it right now. Right? I'll do it right now. Set the date. A global date to shut down the system. Oh my God, would that be so freaking awesome and fun. And you watch the sniveling start. You imagine the sniveling? Think about it. Think about how bad the sniveling would instantly start and the frustration and the feeling of being absolutely helpless and useless that would overcome those people in those positions today. If all of you just stopped. Just stop. Boom. Stop giving your money. Now what are you going to do? What are you going to do now? Are you going to put billions of people in jail? I'm tired of babbling. I threw the prawn traps down over there. I figure hopefully we're going to get enough to have for dinner tonight. Some fresh seafood would be better than that dog shit dip we ate last night. We need at least two hours on the bottom over there. 300 feet of water. Hopefully there's enough big mature prawns there for the two of us to have for dinner tonight. Anyway, as I sit here looking, looking at the mountains, looking at the very spot where I know these people are right now, right now, right there, they are right there. <laughs> I was talking to Sarah earlier about um, me going there, I'm going in there in the dark. Staying well, not in the dark, just going in there and staying overnight, hanging out and, and offering up. Offering up the opportunity to possibly speak back and forth. Hmm. See, I don't even know what to say to that yet. Go with my gut. I'm tempted to do it. I think I'm going to do it, but ultimately I won't know until I hit that trailhead. The ultimate answer. I should probably go, go.
go with Darren, go check out those bones, see if they're still there. I'd almost at this point of the game, I'd lay down big money and bet that those bones are from a bear, considering they left that bear claw in his backpack. Anyway, there we go. I'll be back tomorrow again. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Even though I got guests coming, I still pull this off. And you gotta think, what's it been now? It's been, I don't know how many years, four years? Three, four, five years? Five years. Could you imagine if you had to actually speak to someone who, uh, who wanted to uh, laugh at the topic, and then you told them flat out, well, actually, there's uh, one place where they've been reading eyewitness testimonies for five years straight. Reading eyewitness testimonies for five years straight. <laughs> and then some brands will still go, yeah, but I need some, I need some proof. <laughs> oh my God. God, I hope we can turn it around and erase the, erase the dumb ass ness out of people. Anyway. There we go. Share my story how to hunt.com. I'll remember to put that email link in the description below. The how to hunt store for Sarah's decals, decals, stickers. <laughs> I think there's still some of those left in there and then her usual hats and shit, t-shirts. What else? I don't have a link for something else in there. I don't know. Keep my eye on this boat. He better not be going for my prawn traps. I'm sure you can see me sitting here. He's got to know that we're sitting here waiting on our traps. But anyway, that's all I got to report. I'm real groggy right now. I feel like I've just been through a freaking football game with no sleep. After having that bad, bad dip that we ate. Anyway, share my story at howtohunt.com. Get it to me. Shit, there's more. Look it up the. Look it up the hill. What is it with me and bones and trees? Look at that. That is freaking bizarre. I can't get up near it, but I'm gonna just... Fairly old 